it's good to be here. I always love coming to Biola, and as Matthew said, on and off, I worked here and went to school here for 10 years, and I love this community, and I just need to say hi to the girls of Alpha. Are you here? Love it, and Stuart. Are you guys all at home? Bluff, anybody here? Wow, all right. <laughs> Good to see you online. Um, I do wanna say um, that I'm just so excited that Biola is doing this topic. Um, it's something that a lot of RDs and different people in student development have a lot of private conversations about, and I'm so thrilled that this is becoming a public conversation. Because addiction is something that we're all potentially vulnerable to, and I'm gonna explain that in just a minute, but it's something that has touched a lot of our lives. And, um, and it's an important topic that when understood when addressed and handled well, there can be some real healing. But when it does not go acknowledged and it does not become an issue that is healed and addressed, it can cause a lot of pain and destruction. So let me do this. I'd like to pray for our time um, for just a second and, um, and then we'll get into it. Okay, so let's pray. Father, I just thank you for each person here and have no doubt that quite a few people in this room have been touched by addiction. And I pray for those who are personally struggling that today's message would be a message of real hope and that it would feel like there's a light at the end of the tunnel for them. And for those who have struggled because a loved one has been addicted to something and that it, they have watched that person suffer and be destroyed, I pray for them as well that there would be hope. So would your spirit just fall on us um, speak wisdom and love and kindness over us, and would your compassion um, just begin to heal us. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. So addiction, what is it? I'm gonna do a really simple explanation, but there's a couple different circuits in your brain that they believe are involved in addiction. And those circuits include what we find rewarding, those circuits include what motivates us, and those circuits also include our memory. And when someone becomes addicted, those circuits no longer function in a way that is beneficial to the person or really promotes the person's health. And what I wanna focus on today, because this is very complex and we have about 25 minutes, is I really just wanna focus on the reward circuit and how that particular area can become hijacked and we begin to engage in behaviors that are no longer good for us. So in a normal, healthy reward circuit in our brain, what we find rewarding will be things like food, so isn't that good to know? That's something that's very good for us and I hope you all enjoy food. We will find hydration rewarding. We will find affirming and meaningful relationships rewarding. And we're not gonna get into it too much today, Viola students, but we find sex rewarding. So those four things are things that they have discovered that the brain will be motivated to pursue, and in a healthy brain, we will feel very rewarded by those types of interactions and by those engaging in those different things. Um, and all of those things allow us to remain healthy and allow us to reproduce as people. And those are things that sustain us and keep us going. And I think it's so interesting, if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, when Solomon does all his pontificating about life and what's important and what really matters, he says at the end of the day, the best thing that can happen is you enjoy your, the wife of your youth, you enjoy the work and the labor of your hands, you enjoy good food, and you enjoy drink. And so probably after about $5 billion worth of research, we discovered that that is what the brain is really geared to do, and that is ultimately what is rewarding to us. So, when we function healthy, those things are rewarding. What can happen, and excuse me, I might get emotional because the girl's um, story kind of got to me. What can happen for a person who becomes addicted, and this is why compassion is so important, is what would normally reward a person is no longer, or for some reason has never been, rewarding. And primarily, where a person becomes vulnerable to addiction is when the interpersonal relationships that would normally provide reward provide almost no reward. Those interpersonal relationships instead cause stress and distress and dismay and heartbreak. So their brain, what it's been geared to go after, harms them. 
And at some point, a person can give up going after that. And when they give up going after that, this circuitry becomes vulnerable to something else hijacking it and promising to reward it. And what can hijack it are things that allow what would be painful if those emotional relationships are not rewarding. What might seem to offer reward is something that numbs me from the pain that those relationships have created. The pain may be the belief that I'm not lovable, it might be the belief that nobody likes me, it might be the belief that I'm a loser, that I have nothing going for me, that I'll never amount to anything, that I'm a huge disappointment to people. And because I can't silence that noise, and because that continues to cause me pain over and over and over again, I need something to give me relief. And if that something isn't another rewarding relationship, if that something isn't God, if that something isn't a message that I am loved and I am cared for and I'm important, then I'm gonna look for something just to numb the whole thing. And when I look for something to numb the whole thing, some excellent numbing agents are alcohol, drugs, pornography, video games, and some sort of disordered eating. And what those things allow me to do is feel a sense for even just a small amount of time that that noise that I always hear has been silenced. And over time, if I continue to expose myself to that substance, that substance will now become my primary reward system. I've given up on this, and now I'm going after this. And I'm going after it over and over and over and over again. And as I continue to go after that, the message my brain over time will begin to um, hold on to and will become solidified is this is what you need. This will give you life. This will solve your problems. This will help you feel better. And I will begin to Take the things that would normally sustain me and give me life, food, hydration, affirming relationships, and I will begin to set those aside. They've shown even in rat studies that if they give a rat a certain substance and that rat becomes addicted to it, they can have food and water sitting next to that rat, but that rat will continue to press a lever that will release to that rat, whether it's cocaine or alcohol or whatever, and it will stand there and ingest that substance and request that substance over and over and over again until it kills itself. It's really serious. And where you're at today is a really important stage of your life because if you have begun to engage in addictive behaviors, you have a huge benefit going for you that will eventually, the window will close. The benefit that you have going for you right now is part of that circuitry part of the brain development that will hook us into addictions. In your brain, if you are under 25 years old, your frontal lobe has not fully developed, which is why you do dumb things sometimes. <laughs> and because it has not fully developed, you are the most hopeful people to sustain a long recovery from an addiction but it's gonna be really important that you begin to engage in recovery, in counseling, in 12-step, in some sort of um, system that will help restore your brain to find reward in the things your brain was designed to find reward in. And what happens when you get into a recovery program is you get an opportunity to begin to identify why certain things that should reward you do not, why they no longer or never have felt rewarding. And sometimes that process is painful because you can come to the realization that your primary caregivers, like she had said good friends at school, have really injured you. And revisiting that topic, I'm not gonna lie, can be pretty tough. But in the process of revisiting that topic, there's this incredible opportunity to discover 
the truth about yourself and the truth about God's love that you have never really internalized deep into your soul. So for those of you who have this sense that, gosh, I really know it here, I get God here, or I keep hearing that he loves me, but it translates not at all into my heart and soul. It doesn't move me, it doesn't do anything for me. Um, At the end of the day, I still feel kind of bad about myself, I still feel like I'm a disappointment, Um, I feel like I'm on this treadmill trying to please him, or I've totally given up completely. The process of recovery should help you access those emotions in a way that would allow the Lord to begin to heal them. Because if you don't experience the Lord primarily and foundationally as loving you first and foremost, something's missing in your theology and something's missing in your soul. And that something really needs healing. And it really does need help. And when we don't have that kind of affirming relationship with the Lord and with others, we're just kind of in a really risky, vulnerable state. Addiction can hit somebody at any stage of life. But I, it was so interesting that I didn't know that video was coming up. For some of you, your behavior in addiction began around junior high. It began right around puberty. And I wanna speak to you specifically. If you have engaged in regular use of alcohol, drugs, if you have been primarily addicted to video games or pornography since junior high, I want to send a message to you that it is most urgent that you get help now. There is something about our brain and the way it's developing in that stage of life that leaves us vulnerable and can make those addictive tendencies extremely deeply rooted. And so if you're sitting here wondering for just a moment if that could be me, might I have a problem? Might there be something going on with me? I wanna just ask you to take the risk get out there to the resource table, get into counseling, go to a 12-step program, and start to assess whether or not this thing has gone out of control. Because in my work, for people, especially once they get past age 25, if that addiction began with them in junior high and they do not address it until their brain is fully developed, it is the group of people that I would say is most white-knuckling trying to stay sober. They're desperate, they feel out of control, they're really afraid, and they really struggle. And you have an opportunity to not have to let it go that far and not have it become that out of control in your life. So I just wanna throw that out to those of you um, who are starting to recognize this. And I wanna mention a couple things that you need to be looking for to help assess whether or not something for you has become more addicted than it is just a casual, um, occasional use that hasn't gotten a grip on you. So some warning signs that you wanna look at. One would be negative consequences, meaning educationally, socially, spiritually, or physically, you are starting to experience some negative consequences based on the use of or participation in certain things. So if you are drinking to the point of throwing up and blacking out, that is not a good thing. If you are engaged in drugs and your drug use is making it difficult for you to maintain employment, first of all, it's drug use. Can we just say that? It's just drug use, probably don't wanna do that. But if the participation in it is causing you to have physical symptoms, you're missing class, um, you're um, having a hard time with employment, you're having to lie to cover your tracks, you wanna look at that. I'm so nervous that the people that need to hear this one aren't here, but if you are addicted to video games, you are probably not here, but maybe go back and talk to them. If you are addicted to video games and you are sitting in your room all day, hours on end, bleary-eyed, trying to win, what is it, War of the Worlds or, is that one? What is it? World Warcraft? How often do you play it? No, I'm just kidding. Um, (laughs) I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding, but we could talk. Um, And so, World Warcraft. Um, 
Part of why someone might engage in that is, remember what I said about the primary relationships not being that rewarding? Well, guess what? When somebody is watching porn all day, when somebody's playing video games all day, they feel powerful, they feel capable, they feel like they can, you know, they're in control. And so that's why they're going there. When somebody's taking drugs, alcohol, they might feel invincible or they might just feel relaxed because they can't figure out another way to feel that way. There isn't another avenue to begin to discover how to get that kind of relief or that kind of affirmation. And so if you notice that you're engaging in these things and it's becoming excessive and you're having negative consequences, that should be a huge, huge red flag to you. Huge red flag to you. The other is craving tolerance and dependence. It's something that you're thinking about all the time. When is the next time I'm gonna be able to get this? Um, when is the next time I'll be able to get to my computer? When is the next time I'll be able to get a hold of some alcohol? When is the next time I'm gonna be able to get a hold of some drugs? Prescription drugs, the amount of people addicted to that has skyrocketed in the last 10 years. So if you're online, if you're in conversations with people and you are messing around with prescription medications and changing names and giving false information and visiting multiple doctors, that's a huge problem. Your soul needs healing. Your soul needs healing. That stuff is not gonna heal you. So if you're um, craving it, trying to pursue it, figuring out the next time, that should be a large red flag to you. The other is just a general narrowing of your interests. If there was a time where you were more interested in things like athletics, um, social relationships, um, different hobbies that you have, and all of a sudden your world is narrowing and it's becoming centered and fixated on these activities or on these substances. And it's almost um, like the other things are starting to drop off and fade away. That, again, is another um, huge warning sign. In general, a loss of control. Anytime you take these things to an extreme and you have a time where you realize, I cannot believe I sat there and played that game for that long, or I cannot believe I went to this place, or I went to, got involved in these activities, I thought I would never do that. And you find yourself crossing lines and doing things that you never thought you'd do, that should be a large warning sign. Any kind of lying, hiding, or concealing behavior and activities is a huge warning sign. If right now you have a bottle of vodka hidden in your freezer in your dorm room, something's wrong. If you had to lie to everybody about what you did yesterday, something's wrong. If you're covering up and you don't want people to know how you spent your time because you're ashamed of it, something's wrong. And I don't say any of that to shame you, I say it to alert you that again, your soul needs help in recovery. And finally, in all of this, denial is a huge indicator. So if someone is in here and they're not struggling with this or deeply addicted, they might be open to considering and evaluating themselves based on what I'm saying. If you are deeply addicted, part of the addiction process um, hijacks your cognitive thinking. And in that hijacking, a true addict has a very difficult time um, connecting the dots. This is what we talked about in the memory circuit gets messed up. That this behavior, that I'm, this addicted behavior I'm engaging in is causing these negative consequences. An addict will resist seeing that. So even if every relationship blows up, even if they're losing a job, even if their grades are tanking, um, even if they're physically falling apart, they will resist seeing the connection that this behavior is causing this kind of consequence. And so when someone like me gets up and talks about this, an addict will either say, she is so dumb, or become enraged and call me all kinds of bad names that I won't repeat because I'm at Biola. It'll induce rage in a person. So if you are enraged at me, you might be an addict. And you need to pay attention to that because the first thing your brain will want to do is deny that you are an addict. And it will say that this kind of message is dumb, it's over dramatic, it's too much. Um, some other way that you can kind of, kind of deconstruct a person's character to say that's not somebody worth listening to. 
But if anybody has approached you at any point in your life to say, you know what, I'm concerned about this for you. I'm concerned that maybe this has crossed the line or is out of control for you. I want to highly encourage you to pay attention to that. Um, because part of recovering from this will be the opportunity to learn how to have those areas in your emotional life healed, find new ways for managing shame, for managing pain, for managing anxiety, so that you don't have to turn to these substances or you don't have to turn to these activities to help you. So as we close up, a couple things I really also want to point out in terms of, of just things to pay attention to that I hope will be a catalyst maybe for some of you to get to the resource center. Again, we talked about this cropping up at puberty. If the duration of you using these substances has been for a long time, it's going to be really important that you start to get some help. The other thing that you want to look at is the level of risk that you are willing to take to engage in this. What are you willing to lose? And if that risk has become high, it might be time to reevaluate this. And finally, if the interests that you have have narrowed and you no longer have a good support system around you, or in some ways, based on your own behavior, you have blown up the support system around you, um, it's going to be important that you get into recovery. And what recovery involves often is an opportunity, whether you go to a group like AA or you go to a Celebrate Recovery or Rock Harbor, for instance, has something called Refuge, whether you get into a rehab because you have a real tolerance for the substance and you need that substance to be able to safely exit your system with some medical care. In those kinds of treatment programs, what you begin to hear and what's important to hear is your value as a human being, that that message that you're a disappointment is a message coming from a broken person in broken circumstances, and it is not the end all be all truth about who you are at all. The end all be all truth about who you are is that the God who created the whole universe, the God who is incredibly artistic, loves beauty, loves life and has created life, is the foundation of what is light and what sustains us and gives us hope, that God created you and loves you so deeply. And in restoring us to himself, wants you to know how deeply affirmed you are and that whatever flaw you have, his unfailing love has poured so much grace over it that he will never leave you, he will never forsake you, and you are incredibly important and precious to him. You need to know that, so that these other things can no longer tempt you into some kind of numbing relationship that just tries to stop the noise. You need more than stopping the noise. You need a whole new message. You need a whole new dynamic. And so, as I close, I want to be praying for you, but I, I want to just encourage you, um, don't be afraid to admit this to yourself. Don't be afraid to admit, I might be heading down the wrong track, this might have crossed the line, this is maybe out of control right now, it might be a good idea to talk to someone. Because in that risk, the reward can be incredible and it can change the whole trajectory of your life. And I'm so happy to know for Biola that their hope and desire is if you're there, there's no condemnation. There's compassion and there's help and there's hope that you could have something better and something new and something different. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.